Hello again, in this video I'm painting the texture for a model that I had created previously. Also, I in this very stream I created the texture coordinates for it, but it's far too boring to watch. So here I'm creating a base grayscale layout or sketch of the different body parts of the model and the way that they're laid out on this image. So here I'm doing the head and face, um, including the the top of the head having basically a cloth over it and I'm reminding throughout the stream that this is going to be a very small character on screen so I really only need to worry about the broad sense of scale and and shading on the character not really the tiny details this is a, fi a 512 by 512 texture I think but it probably can be smaller considering how big the character is going to be on the screen I think it's actually 256 I'm not sure but I think it is so here I'm constantly drawing little um, details, but I'm mostly just expanding the range of colors. I'm just going from having just a bunch of grays into actually having pure black and pure white as, as a way to sort of not only expand my range of color picking later on, but also because I want the face to be a focal point. And if you increase the contrast in a certain area, then that becomes a, a focal point whether or not you, you, you sort of planned it to be. Here I created a very simple color layer and changed it to, I think it's soft light, and that's enough for me to give uh, a little bit of sense of color to that spot. The only other parts that are gonna have some color other than the face is the, the, the bag that the character's carrying and the hands, of course. But before I do that, I uh, take care of the cloth here. Now, these are supposed to be really strong, bold shapes. That's why the legs are, th are so thick, because they're, again, meant to be seen from far. So I'm not really worried about having a lot of contrast in the shadows and details that I'm adding in. It's, it's good enough for me that they, are, um, that they are really tubular shapes, that that's fine with, with the whole aspect of the, of the character, because the, the silhouette of the character is what's most important. And so that's good enough for the legs being that dark. And here I'm doing the torso. So I'm figuring out first where's the front and back and whether or not I want this, the head to cast a shadow on the torso. And I will start by adding a little bit of cast shadow, but then sort of realizing that it's it's not a big deal if I don't have like a, a very strong specific shadow. And here I'm also mimicking the shading onto the to the sleeves because it's very confusing for me to look at the sleeves and not see them the same color as the shirt. And here what I'm doing is a very common, um, a very common sort of striped, uh, striped shirt uh, that is very usually associated with cartoon thieves, which in this case, this is a thief character. And here by creating those lines, I'll automatically sort of create that idea of almost like a prison uniform. Um, and here I'm trying to do some sort of laces on the shoes, but as soon as I save the texture and look at it in the model, it kind of looks like ballerina shoes. So I give up on that idea pretty quickly. So here's the texture of the hand. This is a fist uh, sort of um, expanded out. And it's always very confusing to me. And I've done these types of textures multiple times, but it's always very confusing to me about what goes where because it changes depending on where I made the cuts for the UVWs. And I sort of scribble around and eventually I find the spot of the different fingers and where they fold, where, where you can see them folding and whatnot. So I'm basically just looking at, at that part of the, of the model, the hand, and kind of looking for it to, to make sense in a way. And eventually it does make sense. And so I just worry about uh, having it look like a fist from the outside because honestly, again, no one's ever gonna see the bottom part of the hand. Uh, not only because the character is never going to animate the hand up, but also because you can't really move the camera, at least not in that way, that you get to see the bottom of the, of the hand. So here what I'm doing is the uh, bag where the thief puts his stuff, and I'm looking for the brighter spot, which is that top bit there. Um, I do use smudge quite a lot for sort of um, tying things together mostly so literally for smudging um, but it's a very easy pitfall to get into if you're shading to use the smudge to shade what you use the smudge to is actually to expand 
traits of some color onto a different area. So by doing that, you kind of pull things in and you help mix it up. But even then, there's stuff like the mixer brush or you can just use transparency on your brush. What I'm doing here for the smudge is literally creating the sense of wrinkles by sort of smudging colors together in a way, which is kind of what would do if you had color on a palette and you sort of pull your finger around and it, it kind of would mix them in sort of a wavy pattern. And here I'm doing um, details on the stitching of the leather. And it's really not because it needs the detail, but it helps sell the idea that that is leather because of the way that it's been stitched together, basically. And um, overall, the, the texturing job is, is, is kind of done. So I'm here, I'm just saving the files, making sure that I get... Um, oh, I, I did forget about the strap that would hold on the bag. And I kind of give up on that idea and instead just have the bag on the bottom. I even create this piece of mesh to act as a leather strap to go around it. But I didn't have the, the texture space on the UVWs because I had completely forgotten about it. So in the chat, someone suggests that maybe you could just carry the bag under his, his, his arm. And that actually, I quite like that idea. It makes sense. I really don't need to retexture it. It does look wrong now because the hands and the arms have not been repositioned. So here I'm, I'm putting all the normals, I'm unifying all the normals so that I have less and less amount of normals. I also scale the model to its final scale using a reference. And once everything is set, so once the, the model has been reset uh, to his actual scale, I add, you couldn't really tell, but I added the, um, the sections on the arms for the elbows to bend. And here I'm just creating, a, using my iPad to create the uh, uh, animation rig and I'm using the simplest, smallest form of the rig that I can because I really don't want to use too many bones. And once you get half, you can actually copy and paste the structure from one side to the other, and that's pretty much what I do. So here I'm testing the rig, and the, this rig is going to be really, really flawed on almost all aspects, and I want you guys to understand that this is a job badly done. Not on purpose, but more to the point that there's no reason to improve the, the the rig because of how small the character is going to be, how little time I, I have. So it's basically a production decision rather than an artistic decision. It's some it's this, the kind of stuff that is going to go under the radar, even for the art director, which in this case is me. So it's not really going to go under the radar, but it's one of those things where it's not really um, going to affect the overall look of the game and it's not going to look out of place. So the rigging will probably look a little bit better from the side, but from the top where it's going to be seen most of the time, it's going to be absolutely fine. So here I'm creating a, a looping animation for the idle pose. So the rig is done, the skinning is done. And what I'm doing is just having him sort of nervously look back and forth. And in this case, not really nervously because he's smiling. So it's actually him kind of going, hmm, what can I steal next? It's more that idea, or is there something else for me to steal? Because if not, he was probably just gonna go away. And uh, here's the animation in, in real time of the character idling, there you go. So it's a looping animation, just that. And so now it's time for the running animation. And the running animation, oh, I add some sharp into the texture just to see if there's anything. So the running animation is pretty much a looping animation as well. It's going to be pretty fast. I think it's about 13 or 14 frames. I'm not sure. And he's supposed to be like really um, um, energetic. Legs uh, pointing forward, really stretched out. Back as well. And the arms extended sideways. So you can really see the arm moving uh, when you're looking at it from above. You can cry, uh, kind of see the arm describing that movement. Now I've kind of animated loads of run, run cycles and um, they're not pretty easy to make. They're pretty fun to make, but not that easy to make. But this one was a really fun one to, to do because it's a very kind of cool, again, fast paced running. So here it is at, um, at its full speed, really tiny. And, uh, and here it is also in a, a close-up or side view, but also at like real speed. Here it is. Kind of fits with the facial expression of the guy being so happy. Like I'm going not on, on an adventure, but I'm going on a, a thieving spree, so to speak. 
So the other mini animations that this character needs is a looting animation, so a picking up something animation, and that's what I'm going to do now. A stabbing animation, which I'm not really going to show in in uh, real time, but it's pretty much it's him extending the arm forward with a, a little knife that I model really quickly. And in this case, really, the only thing that he does is actually there's a bit of a timing issue where I just make the character hold a certain pose for a bit so that it looks like he's collecting. There we are. This is the real time animation. He's just like grabbing something, taking a moment and then shoving it into the into the bag. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much how complicated that animation was, which is not really. We aren't using any animation blending because most of the animations are meant to be arc, uh, sort of arcade and, and snappy. And, you know, we use arcade as a term to remember games in which the technology of animation blending didn't exist. So you either made the animation blending by hand, by creating a, a, an, an extra animation, or you would just... Um, or you would just basically not have it. So this little dagger that I made is actually just a, a prop for the animation. The character is going to use models that have already been made in the game, but I still needed a visual reference of what the weapon is going to look on the hand of the character because it I would need to rotate the hand to match that rotation. Here I'm also doing the death animation. The death animation I usually start with the first frame and last frame because it's not a looping animation. And then I'll go to the middle and just figure out a, a midway frame where you can kind of see the kind of what the pose is. And this this is basically the death animation in real time. And you can see it here, just falling back and having a little bit of bounce on the ground. The little bounce on the ground also prevents the character from looking a little bit weird if it is falling on a surface that isn't completely horizontal, which I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen all the time. And... Um, but it's basically a, um, a way to sort of convey that there's a little bit of energy that's been lost. And I think this is like the sequence of the animation, just the running animation in loop because it's my favorite one. And it's probably the one that you're going to see the most in the gameplay. Probably the one that you're going to worry about the most, but the one you're going to see the most. So hope you guys enjoy this. Take care and I'll see you some other time.